and the line between religion and spirituality in many, I mean, it's always quite a thin line, it's blurred. Everything starts with spirituality and turns religious when we start to organize it, when we start to formalize it, when we try to, to put people around that and have a kind of system that we can repeat. So it turns into religious where it becomes more dogma, rules, beliefs, etc. And, uh, and then when I when I heard about the that I was again once again invited to to share something at the, at the conference, I was very happy to do that, of course. But I thought, what should I do? Should I do my usual stuff of the kind of work I'm doing usually, or should I do something a bit more uh, challenging in inverted comma? And as you very rightly say, Atul both in the mainstream world of education and in the alternative world, and maybe even more in the alternative world, uh, religious is uh, out of the picture very fiercely almost. You know, like, <laughs> you're not supposed to be religious. <laughs> and there's a good element of that, of course, we want to make our own mind, we want to explore life, to experiment it firsthand. We don't want you know, the framework to, to condition us. So. But it removes something, it, uh, it makes us uh, miss on something, which, uh, which is what I wanted us to, to briefly look at today. And, uh, and that's what we're going to do. So what I've designed, uh, it's not going to be very participatory. We, we have a very short time. It's a very interesting subject. So I would like just mostly to, uh, to offer a number of... Uh, of, of insight that I really got from my own life. I'm sharing from experience only because that's how I learn. I, I read very little, but um, I observe a lot. I experience a lot. I practice. And that's how I've learned the little bits that I know. <laughs> so so that will be the session. And then we'll have a, we'll have a lot, you know, informal live interaction. Like uh, if, if there's anything you want to share at some point or, or raise or ask. And then hopefully, We'll finish with a, a kind of inward journey to touch maybe something inside. So the, the, the context in which I want to, to put this sharing is, uh, is first the, the human context, but also the context of the times. And the context of the time are quite important because uh, we are living, as all of you are aware, in a, in a in a very intense transitional period. We are right in the middle of a, a transformation that is beyond what we can imagine. It's very fast, very intense. All the structures are changing, all the, the mindset are changing. And so when we look at education, the, the first thing we need to be clear about, am I educating to, to fit into an old system that is kind of showing serious signs of, a, of being in a very bad state and crumbling or am i educating am i looking at education to create something new to 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 prepare the next step to prepare what comes after that period of transformation transition crisis and chaos in which we are doing that and obviously for all of us here the, the answer is, a, is the second one we are here to create to to facilitate the emergence of something new and, uh, and it requires an, a set of skills that, uh, that are not the obvious skills of, uh, of what we teach usually. Because uh, facilitating the, the emergence of something new is nice to say, but how do we do that? Because it's new, we don't know what it is. <laughs> and then how do we prepare ourselves for that? And how do we educate so that we can embrace that newness and bring it to life? And here, spirituality comes in the, in the picture uh, very big, because, uh, because that's what I want to explore today. <laughs> Is that making sense? Are we okay on that? On the, yeah? And so, so that's, the, that's the, the global planetary uh, current time context, transformation and therefore newness and therefore uh, we need to learn to surf the waves. We need to, to learn to handle the unknown. We need to learn to, to bring about something that we didn't know 10 minutes ago and yet be able to work with that. And the second context is the, is the human context. And, 
And here I just want to, to briefly introduce the, the model that I'm using to, to read the human being and to and, and myself, of course, the first one, but to read a human being, to understand it and to 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 help it grow, to help it expand and grow and manifest properly, which is a which is a model of five main dimensions. Huh? It's, it's a very simple thing. Huh? Uh, the first one, we have a physical dimension that all of us know. We, we see those bodies day in, day out. We have a mind dimension that all of us know also. So those two things are quite different. You don't educate the mind like you educate the body. You don't develop the mind like you develop the body. We have also an emotional dimension. Again, it's a completely different logic there. The mind works with a number of, of, of principles, but the heart works with very different rules and very different principles. It's a completely different ball game. And we have an energy dimension that we need to know how to cultivate, how to maintain, how to focus. And we have a spirit dimension, which is uh, which is where our deep identity is sitting. So we are working with those five, and and in the context of uh, of that conference, we're talking about education and self education because it's the two are overlapping constantly. <laughs> in today's world, if we want to be an educator, the first thing we need to do is to be able to educate ourselves because that's by doing that that we understand. Uh, the mechanism, the processes that we put ourselves in the game, like uh, as actors, not as teacher. Or as a... So education, self-education overlaps constantly. And it involves those five dimensions. Uh, we need to understand our mind. We need to understand our emotion. We need to understand our energy. We need to know how to handle our bodies and our physical reality. And knowing who we are, because that's the root at the end of the day. And in all of those, and that's where I want to point today, in all of those, the, the, one of the base fundamental conditions to be able to do that, to be able to engage those different dimensions of our humanness is the ability to create relationships. Because we relate to our mind, we relate to our emotion, we relate to our energy, and we relate to ourselves. We human beings, we are blessed with that ability to be who we are, but also to look at who we are. And we are the only creature who can do that. All the other creatures, they are who they are, but they can't look at themselves. They can't reflect on their own existence, but we can. And that's what makes us so powerful and so amazing. That we can look at ourselves, we can reflect on who we are, we can transform, we can participate into our own evolution. And the foundation of that is the ability to connect, to relate to. And then when I'm working with people, and it's been the, the big thing for me to, because we tend to, to operate with, uh, you know, with formulas, with concepts, with theories, and we apply that, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> but we are not always very sensitive to the quality of the relationship that I establish with myself, the world, my emotion, my mind, or, or a child or a friend or whatever. Because we live in a mental world a lot. Today, the world is, uh, you know, everything has gone here. And, uh, and emotions are kind of uh, you know, alternative things. They are not mainstream. <laughs> so that ability to connect is, uh, is both the foundation of, uh, of understanding, being able to see and of exchanging, of course, therefore learning, and also of being able to act on ourselves, to act on things. And this is the very point of, uh, of that world, religion. Uh, religion for most people is associated with uh, belief systems, dogma, and bloodshed. <laughs> or nonsense, you know, that's the kind of a spontaneous association that we have. But the world religion comes from a Latin word, which is religare, and it means to connect, which is exactly the same et etymological root as yoga. To connect, to tune in, to harmonize things, to be with. And that's the root of, 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 of what we call religion, before it became those piles of books. <laughs> 
And it's something very simple that all of us do, that every living organism do, does. We, we connect, we sense, we feel, we perceive. And to me, being religious is this, is, a, is a developing that ability to, to connect to life. And when I say life, I, I say me, you, the world, nature, animals, the whole thing, life with a capital L. And to connect to life at, I will not say sensory, but at, at an existential level, instead of connecting to it through you know, concepts, ideas ready-made ideas like we see often in conversation you know, we we pretend to listen but we know the answer already or we are preparing our answer <laughs> that's not a connection that's not a relationship that's a, that's an argument and so religare yoga religion to me is that that very heart of connecting at an existential level not at a mental level and of course it involves the heart of course it involves uh, feelings. Is that making sense? Yeah, we're okay. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll just uh, I'll just build a bit on that, and we'll open the we'll open the conversation for your comments for whatever you would like to share on that. Uh, I just want to to mention a brief incident in my life that happened when I was uh, 25, 26, <clears throat> and it was my first uh, the first time that thing came in my consciousness clearly that. The difference between approaching intellectually and approaching existential. I, I love stone. I, I used to have a very beautiful passion for stone. I used to find them so beautiful, etc. So back when I was young, someone on the first day offered me a very big uh, book about, about precious stones. And they were magnificent pictures. I love pictures. And there was also a kind of scientific approach to understanding those stones. And when I opened that book, I really loved the picture. But then when I started to read how those people, those scientists, were approaching the understanding of a stone, the very first thing they were doing to that stone to understand it was to break it. The very first thing they were doing to understand that stone was to break it, to see what's inside, to see how much it bears pressure. And I thought, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute, that thing is magnificent. And because you love it, you break it. No, 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 no. <laughs> because you understand it, you break it. There must be another way of understanding. And it was really like the first time I, I clicked on that idea. And then as I developed my, my own meditation practice and connecting with people, and I did a lot of teaching in inverted coma, but very improvised, like uh, you have a few concepts, but you go in the conversation. And I realized that uh, we can't understand something if we don't love it. Because to, to understand something, I need to connect to that thing. And to connect to that thing, I need to, to come from an attitude of, uh, of respect, of appreciation, of love. And in many educational systems, we, we separate learning with love but they're actually completely intertwined. We cannot separate them. Because if I don't love that stone, if I don't love that person, and by love, I mean, you understand, eh? respect, appreciation, curiosity. And if I don't have that attitude, there's no way I can learn anything. Even if I analyze, even if I talk, even if I exchange concepts and theories, there is no learning. There is no transformation because that transformation happens through that contact of, of love. And to me, that was a very, very big thing when I, when I started to, to explore that, uh, th that concept. I mean, not a concept, but that, that in my own practice to, to, to walk through life and to, to look at things from that perspective that before I want to to understand, to have a conversation, to share or to learn or to give or to whatever, I need to establish that connection. And, and that's how yogis learned. That's how meditators learned. Uh, some of you may know Sadhguru is a very interesting man in many ways, but I really love the way he say, 
when I was a kid, I was staring at things. Like, you know, he will look at three hours at a, uh, at a leave. I was staring at things like this. And, and I heard him talking. And when, when I was hearing this, it was kind of giving names to my own experiences. Because I experienced those things. Just looking at something with nothing special in your head, no specific question, no analyzing, nothing. Just looking at it closely, looking, watching, sensing, listening, feeling it. And then suddenly you start to have some insights emerging eh, that you don't know where they're coming from. <laughs> and, and that's the way someone who practices meditation or practices yoga, or the, the yoga meditation, not the Atta yoga, which is a preparation for the, for the meditation, but the actual meditation of what we call yoga, which is establishing that link with yourself, establishing that link, that connection, with, with the, the, the whole of life and uh, this for that taboo word, but and we've gone also. <laughs> because that's also something we've put out of the picture very, for some of us, very firmly that we, no, we don't want that. Let's call it cosmic energy, let's give it another name, but <laughs> because that word has too much nonsense around it. So a meditator knows that you, you prepare yourself, you establish a connection, and through that connection, you have a download of information. And you start to know something without involving a mental process, without involving the conditioned mind, without involving any framework. It's a download. And sometimes you don't even know what you are learning. It's emerging later. And I used to study like this. I used to, to listen to lectures like this. I will go in meditation and I will not pay attention to the lecture. I will just listen very carefully, be, be here, without any attempt to memorize, even understand. <laughs> and doing this, wisdom comes from inside. And, I, and I'll touch that in the second part of the conversation. And it's really a download. And we download the plant, we download the the, 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 what an animal wants to say. We download what the situation wants to say. We, we, we connect heart to heart, soul to soul. And this is, this is yoga. This is religion to me. This is uh, the result of that uh, care, of that appreciation, of that interest in life. Am I making sense? Yeah? And, uh, and just to, to close on that, uh, on that introduction, what that kind of mind knows, what the religious, the really religious mind knows, what the yogic mind knows, not because it has read it somewhere in a book, but because it, it is seeing it, feeling it. What the yogic and the religious mind knows is that everything is alive. There is not a single piece of this planet that's dead. That everything is alive. And by alive, it means sensitive. It feels you. It means it has an awareness. And it means it has an intention. And that's a very interesting uh, opening of our awareness because the moment we, we develop that attention to the, the quality of connection and we start to discover that everything has a sensitivity, everything has a certain intelligence, everything has an intentionality, then you read that. And in terms of you know, creating beautiful relationship, sharing things, educating, understanding what's going on around you and within you, this is a magical one because it gives you access to the real stuff. And that's a problem many of us have. We, we look at reality, we look at situation with concept, but concept are concept. Reality is always beyond concept, always. And as long as we look with concept, we don't really see the real thing. We, we, at best, we have an approximation of it. But when we, when we cultivate that religious mind, <laughs> In ourselves, we, we access the we access the real thing. We access the existential level where the real game is happening, and the real game is sensitivity. That's primary. How do you feel? How do I feel? And how those two things together? Intention, 
What do you want? And now, now I have access. Now I have access to a layer of reality where the real game is happening, where I can really work at, at, the, at that level. So that's a, that's the, the the introduction I wanted to to share with you. I'd love to hear your uh, your reactions, your comments, your uh, your insights, or whatever is alive and comes in you. Namali, yes. Thank you so much, Frederick, for sharing that. I've I've enjoyed the daily check-ins with you, and it's just so mm -hmm. moving to share what you said and uh, what the thing that really comes to mind when you share the idea of just being with something to learn about it it makes me think of my daughter she's three and you know this is exactly what she does i was waiting for you when i saw your hand you said well, children are coming <laughs> <laughs> yeah it and it just it just made me think I, I do it. I, I'm always mindful not to interfere when she's, you know, engaged with something. But when you were speaking, it just made me more convinced that like, I need some more to not interfere. You know, I need to get myself out of the situation as much as possible, you know. So thank you for that. It was, it, it was so good. Yes, when you observe children, you see them doing that like masters. They have that full ability to tune into things and, and to learn just like that. Uh, you don't need to explain for three hours. They, many things, they just get it because they see, they look. They are not blinded yet with all the you know, so-called knowledge. <laughs> there have been a few hands raised. I, don't, I didn't see who raised first. So let's say who wants to speak first. I think Lauren, uh... Yeah, I see the sequence on my side. You have a sequence. You want to tell this one. Much love. I, I just wanted to say I, I understand about relationships because um, <laughs> you tend to see the relationship that you have or you develop with people outside of yourself. But I just recently developed a relationship with myself to, at mm -hmm. that at those same levels. And being unaware that I, I wasn't already in a relationship with myself. And so once there, I I, I recognized that my, my association with nicotine for 42 years was actually uh, not a behavior, but a relationship. It was. Beautiful. And so when I put it in my mind and I literally said the words, I'm divorcing this nicotine <laughs> as a form of relationship, as opposed to stopping it, yeah. my behaviors changed. And, uh, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm sitting here, you know, three weeks deep without the desire of, 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 of nicotine because it was a divorce. I, I broke the relationship as opposed to cease the behavior. And it, it, yeah. it, for somebody who's like me up here all of the time, it's what worked. And, and it's, I just see it. So I wanted to just affirmation relationships beautiful yes definitely and Thank this is a fundamental thing in our life because relationship is where you put your attention you put your energy and if you keep your energy there and your attention there and you say i'm going to stop this behavior you have no chance exactly like you say but the moment you say no i don't i want to relate to something else i don't want to relate to that anymore then at that moment you're empowered to make it happen that's beautiful happened to me also many years ago with nicotine with alcohol with ganja you name it <laughs> long time ago long time ago <laughs> and suddenly the thing went somewhere else the relationship went somewhere else i mean it went to god in my case i had a massive experience like uh, fell from i didn't know where and i didn't know that what that thing was but it was so intense that my whole attention went there and literally in one day i dropped alcohol in uh, two, three days, I dropped the ganja, and I was on ganja from morning till night. And it took me two weeks, one week to drop cigarette from you no know, one packet to one a day, and then finally dropped it. And I looked at it and said, how did that happen? How did that happen? And that was exactly what you are sharing. It's just my attention, my relationship went poof. 
this is so interesting, so magnificent, and the whole thing went off. Just fell of its of its of its own. You know? Oh, that was something. So thank you for sharing that. Yes. I don't stop. I don't quit smoking. I, I divorce. <laughs> and I'll get a good deal. And I don't keep the kids. <laughs> thank you for that, Lauren. Thank you. Where are you from? Where are you living? I'm in New York. You're in New York. Okay. Yes, okay. yes, 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 I am. So New York has become a more healthy city. Well, you know, um, <laughs> I always say I was New York born, but worldly grown. Of course, of course, of course. Relationship again. Yeah, yeah you know, I'm a, into, uh, I, I'm a nomad. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. Thank you. Devine Roxanne, who's next? And another participant raised their hand. Who's that? Atul, who's next? Devin. <clears throat> Devin. Hmm. Thank you so much, Frederick. Thank you all for mm. this space. Thank you. I'm very grateful to be here at this conference and in this session. Um, as you were talking, Frederick, it's occurring to me. Um, I, I think we're at one of the most incredible possible times to be alive right now, because okay. not just because we're in an incredible, like intense, fast transition, like you're saying, but um, because I, I used to, you know, in the beginning when I was growing up, I, I just completely wrote off religion. I said, this is crazy. You know, science makes more sense. Then I started to follow and appreciate religious and spiritual paths. And I said, wow, science, this is ridiculous. This doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and um, I think what's amazing right now, because there's work I want to do sort of outside the school system, you know, with now I think with universities, with, with the Alliance, maybe start my own university someday outside of my job but my everyday job is teaching first grade and um teaching first grade in a public school in the u.s i cannot talk about religion it's not possible i know there are college professors who say well i might be fired if i talk about spirituality i know mm -hmm. i would be fired if i start talking about religion in the classrooms. Mm -hmm. but something that's very special right now i think is that there are some small branches streams of science that can help people to understand their deep interconnectionness with everything in a way that does not require or contradict anyone's religious or non-religious beliefs. So I think there's enormous potential there for, it's almost like using the system to undo the system, but not in a, not in a angry or vengeful way, but in a very gentle way of saying like, we don't, we don't have to talk about God. We don't have to talk about that, but you should know that when you breathe in, the oxygen that goes inside you has been inside every other living thing in the in the last mm -hmm. two years. Or every, you know, the dinosaurs, every every human, it's, we are very deeply connected. Re connected. We're more like the aspen tree that's like one organism. It's just the connections are not visible to us all the time. But I think there's really wonderful potential for it. In some contexts, like in my first grade classroom in a public school, um, science, like mindfulness-based research, like understanding interconnectedness has some potential for bringing some of that beauty of religious interconnection wisdom into a secular context. Obviously. So science and psychology is a, I've understood those things since a long time. It's not gone mainstream for a number of reasons. <laughs> But uh, the data is there, and it's clear, and it's pretty clear. But still, they are kind of denying it, playing with it, because that will involve changing many things. Uh, we know very clearly since 20 years that plants are sensitive. They, they hear you, they respond to you, they respond to your presence when you enter the room. Uh, it's, it's, it's known, but that will mean many that will involve many changes you know, in our social structure. And so they're not prepared for them. And, but there's something that, uh, that I've used a lot in, uh, in all my teachings here and uh, is to, and that's something very powerful and very simple, to help young people connect to their heart. Because the moment you connect to your heart, you connect to that interconnectedness, you connect to that sensitivity, you connect to a lot of things that will take ages to, to explain. The moment an individual feels their heart, 
they discover their morality also they discover their you know their own goodness and it's direct it happens like ah oh. <laughs> you don't need to teach for 20 years it's a, it's an obvious thing and i've been using that a lot to bypass all those mental argumentation science spirituality this that and the other because it's a very complex thing and to to bypass that completely and, and again connect help people connect to that part of them that is the connector because when i was uh, i really want to share this because to me it was a huge key also when i was talking of those five dimensions the you know the body the, the physical dimension the energy dimension the feeling dimension the mind dimension and the spirit identity mind can never connect we spend hours talking but we never connect with our mind the mind works on memory it's a closed circuit no one can understand me and i can't understand anyone with that <laughs> because I, I, my mind works based on my experience and it's completely unique and it's massive so we try to understand each other at that level it's just in plain impossible we're wasting our time but the connector, the part, the instrument of connecting is the heart. It's with our feelings that we connect with reality. And before we think, before we react, before whatever, there is a feeling. And if we can, and the, the beauty of that feeling, I mean, there's a whole to say about heart intelligence, but it's a fascinating thing is because first, this is the V connector. It puts you in contact with reality. How many times do I do that? You see an external, you see a person, you see the mask, the show, the body language, blah, 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 and they look fantastic. And you go in your heart and you see what's going on there and say, ooh, ooh, pretty dark, <laughs> you know, pretty unpleasant. It doesn't look that fantastic. And the heart steps right in. It sees the inner side of things. Connects, direct, poof. And so helping someone to come into their heart is a tremendous gift you give them because they access that. And, and they bypass completely the, I mean, the doubting and the argumentation comes later, but at least. <laughs> Thank you for raising that, Devin. There's a lot to, to explore about art intelligence. It's a fascinating thing. And it's, it's really related with what I was sharing because religion, religare, yoga, this is something of the heart. It's primarily about feelings, primarily. And, and the heart, we've, we've associated the heart with feelings, emotion, but it is an instrument of knowing. We know, the heart knows so many things, very precisely. You've experienced that. Eh? You ask your mind, it's giving you 20,000 answers. You ask your heart, it's giving you one, and that's the right one. <laughs> Because the heart understands that we need to find a solution that feels good, it's good for our health, and it's good for everyone. The, for the heart, this is the logic. And it is a voice. It speaks. It really speaks. <laughs> and the mind will find solutions, but maybe those solutions will not feel good. Maybe they will not promote health. Because the mind doesn't understand those things, doesn't feel them. Mm, thank you, thank you, thank you. Atul, who's next? <laughs> uh, Rosine? Uh, yeah. 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 Thank you, Roxanne. Yeah. Um, Frederick, yeah. I just, I want. We've lost you. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Which part okay, did you bye. get? I, I just started saying thank you so much for taking this topic and addressing it so also um, so heartfully um, mm -hmm. because I think it is at least for us I mean I grew up non-religious even though I grew up in Denmark where um, it, religion is not separated as in France like in a sense of that you have this that we don't have that the the church is deeply integrated but it is and I never even consider these things that you're mentioning religion spirituality because the church is implemented by word by not by heart we talk about you know we we yeah maybe mm. we go to church but i had a recent situation where my um husband mother she she called him and said ah your sister she she took a test and um from the test she has adhd so you also have adhd probably so you know we can find some medication and my husband 
uh, he called me and I said, but are you not more than a social construct? I mean, don't you have a soul? Don't you have a will of your own? How can you deduct that? And I, I feel like this, you know, like this um, way of viewing. And if you ask, and I, and I, when I ask these questions, people usually become deeply uncomfortable. It is not considered normal to speak of the soul, to speak of um, anything beyond. And, um, and we, even in our case, I mean, we started going, I started looking into, because I, I realized this, uh, so, so also I originally am from uh, Russia and my grandmother, she used to close down churches. You know, she was a, one of a, a good communist. So she closed mm -hmm. down churches back in the days. But I have realized and found that my great grandmother, she was deeply spiritual, deeply, deeply. Mm -hmm. And she would, you know, um, mm -hmm. so I'm finding that with children, I'm reconnecting to my own roots and discovering this path of connection. Mm -hmm. Probably it's a better word, as you're saying, the relationships that we have and um, mm -hmm. going back to actually what is the soul, what is the mind, what is the spirit, what is all that? And also mm -hmm. learning here in our case, we, I try to at least go to like, a, we have a Rudolf Steiner, you know, like school kindergarten and, and, and at least because they recognize that the soul is there and that it's more than just the body. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm struggling with this concept of what is the word? What is the spoken word? What is the actual um, you know, that deeper, deeper level that you're um, yeah. mentioning. And, and this for now brought us to Portugal, where we're also finding people that are honestly just as lost as I, in the sense of their young families um, and, and uh, you know, trying to connect with the heart and trying to, to feel that way, but also probably feeling lonely in our search for that, you know, mm -hmm. how we could give it to our children. And we spent some, I spent some weeks, I don't know if you're familiar with the um, Plum Village in France, but they, it was a Chitnatan's like center back then. And we spent some time there and it was fascinating because there we had children that, you know, the children couldn't speak the same language, but all our children were playing inclusive games mm -hmm. and all of our children were, they were all wholeheartedly connected and mm -hmm. here they're not. So it was just, I just, um, yeah, thank you. I'm deeply grateful for this topic and just opening up the thoughts on this because this is so, so needed and so difficult as well. Yeah, thank you. It's not that difficult. And that's, that's one of the reasons that motivated me to take up that topic because it's actually something very natural. Uh, natural, but yet defining. That's what I mean, like connecting with people. I like um, in our right. systems that it's something that's not that accepted to, to no, mention and discuss that. That's what I mean, yes. Yeah. yeah, of course, of course. But uh, what I mean through that is that uh, there are simple practices that we can bring in our, in our life, which is kind of meditation practice, to really establish ourselves into that position so that we really developed it as a skill. Because feelings can be misleading also. Just going with the heart can be misleading. So it's not as simple as that, unfortunately, because there are interferences. The mind interferes with feelings also. So sometimes feelings are not, uh, they're corrupted also, they've lost their integrity. But uh, integrating uh, like a kind of meditation practice where you, you consciously, uh, there are two main things huh, in terms of practices. We won't have time, I think, to do a, an experience together. But if you want to know more, just connect to me and I'll share a few things with you. But uh, there are two main practices that are extremely essential to, to develop that as a proper stable skill, not as an occasional experience. <laughs> One is to, to bring our awareness in the heart and to see what's there, because there are images there, there are, there's a lot of stuff happening in that. This is a field of consciousness. It's not just a, you know, beating stuff, but consciousness is here in the mind and consciousness is also here in the heart. And now we know consciousness is everywhere in the body actually. <laughs> But the heart is a very, uh, it's, it's really a gateway into what's really going on inside you and what's really going on outside you. So, and so training our consciousness to come back here because many, very often when we look for, you know, we look for a solution, we, we go like this, you know, our eyes go up. We look in the field of the mind. I lived in Vietnam for many years and, and I saw Vietnamese people operating like this. They operate with the heart. And they talk to each other, they don't look at each other. And you see the head is slightly like this, the ear is listening to what's going on here. And they're passive, that's where they look at you. They don't look at you here, they don't look at you here, they look at you here. And this is something I tell you. 
It's a very precise perception. They sense you like this, and then it comes to their minds, okay. So just retraining ourselves to go inside the space of the heart and to become aware of what's going on there. And the second one is, uh, that's the, this one is the kind of base meditation also to, to distance myself from the mind consciously. That I, I am the, you know, I'm the seer, I'm the observer. I'm not the mind, let the mind do whatever it wants to do. <laughs> I'm not that thing, I, I divorce from the mind. <laughs> Not I divorce, but you know, I give myself the opportunity to go on holiday sometime because it's, it's a bloody no, noisy thing, you know, and sometimes it's really stupid. Sometimes it's really stupid. So that ability to get out of it for a few moments at least, that you know, you can take a breath and, and look at things. And the way of doing that is not difficult. The way of doing that is really to pay attention. Because the moment you pay attention, the moment you listen, you watch, then the mind goes, oh. You know, suddenly it goes quiet. You say, oh, something is happening. <laughs> and just paying attention. That's why they have those practices in Buddhism of mindfulness. Just pay attention. Pay attention. Whatever. You don't need to pay attention to spiritual things. Pay attention. Yourself, the world, others. And like this, the mind becomes quiet. And we start to have access to, to that deeper intelligence or that higher intelligence. Yeah, those two, those two practices. If you are interested, just drop me a mail. I will leave my email off. I have some guided audio on that. You can use them on your, on your site to really develop that, uh, to explore that dimension. Mm. Thank you, Roxanne, for saying, for sharing, sorry. <laughs> Judith, you've been waiting for so long. Hi. It's worth the wait, I must say. Thank you. Mm. So I just want to acknowledge in the space the energy and the spirit because uh, yesterday I was in a session with Propa and Devin on, you know, uh, poetry. And I, in that space, I wrote about <clears throat> uh, connecting with the invisible. And, um, and I think you know, in your introduction, are you talking about, so we're talking about reimagining education mm -hmm. outside the known. And how do we then create that condition that is new if all the tools and methods and theories that we use are already before us? Right. For me, wow. connecting to the, to the unknown, to the, to the thing that is not yet here or that is new is uh, yeah. yeah it's in the realm of the spirit and in the energy of that emerges in the connections um that could yeah. be had in the spaces yeah. that we're in and this is my experience in this very moment uh, with you and before coming to into this space today you know it's almost that that writing that I did yesterday already carried me here to kind of invite me before I knew what it was doing to me to kind of right. yeah, yeah. connect to the invisible to, and I think <clears throat> connecting to the self, to my self, to my body, um, to my heart is sort of like what I see in education is treated like a default connection. That oh, this is my body. Surely I'm, you know, connected um, to it already, and yet. <laughs> but our education has absolutely, you know, disconnected us to ourselves in ways that connected me specifically. I teach. I teach in a university in Liverpool, so I'm mm -hmm. connected with theories. I'm connected with concepts. I'm connected with learning outcomes, standards you know, assignments, whatever. And I, I, I'm a lover of words and philosophers, if you like, mm. and scholars, and I write myself in that way. And mm. so, you know, and when you can label something and construct it and put it in a yeah. framework, and that sounds so, <laughs> you know, like, oh, knowledge and innovative. And mm. yet it's all mm. disconnected, as you said, yes. To, yes. To, to the rest of you. And I feel um, 
especially post pandemic when you know we, we our conversation in in meetings about our students engagement and widening participation is about how do we change them how do we change this behavior that behavior and what i've learned is you you focus on your own energy you focus yeah. on your own spirit you yeah. focus on your own heart yes, yes. the change will happen I've, I've experienced that is amazing when i stop actually looking yeah. at my daughter <laughs> for example why are you doing this <laughs> you know quite i just have to change me my yes. you know the energy that i kind of exhibit to the world and uh, you know to her and then you know she just phones me and she, she basically embraces what i was actually saying because exactly. i'm sort of like embracing just me so if i connect to me and the word that kind of i that taught me a lot is be here be present and that's hard. I, I've always asked, how do I how, how do I become present? And you said it. You know, don't don't be in this space with all your questions or with your theories or already ready with your answers. Just be there. You know, just be there and it will come. It will embrace you. So it's just so affirming to be in a space with people who kind of have that energy to 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 share an aliveness outside the mental sphere of education. Outside Thank you so much. Thank you. Just to pick up, thank you for sharing that, Judith. Just to pick up briefly on what you're sharing, uh, there are two things I want to, 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 to comment on that, two interesting ones. So the first one is uh, education is not about uh, programming. It's not about engineering, but it's about gardening. You grow people. You grow people, and, uh, and and when you know uh, what's going on in the garden, you know very well that you can't open that flower. It needs to open at its own time. If you open it, you kill it. You know? <laughs> and you can't even work on the flower. There's nothing to do about that flower. The but the thing you do, you you prepare an environment. You make sure the soil is rich. You make sure you know you feel good about it. You love it. You water it. You give it blah 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 whatever it needs. And uh, so that's that's the, the first concept I wanted to share because it's a very important concept. It, it flips the coin, if you like. it, Because uh, a gardener is someone who observes. They observe a lot. Because even if you read the book, you still need to read the weather and to read the, you know, the, the, the degree of, uh, of humidity, et cetera, et cetera. And then the second thing I wanted to share with you about that presence. What I what I found for myself in, in my relationship of uh, of service with others of teaching, when I used to go into teaching, I used to go really empty hand. I don't know what's going to happen, but I, I was seeing what was happening. I was here, present, alert, intentional, because presence is not enough. I am intentional. I really want to contribute something, whatever that is. I don't know what it is. Let's see, or I want something beautiful to happen. I'm clear on that. Very intentional, and my knowledge is at the back here. And I am aware, I am attentive, intentional, and there's a, an automatic process, like in nature, you know, you don't do anything to grow the rose, nature does it. So same thing in our consciousness. You are alert, you are attentive, you are focused, you are connected, and your mind, your consciousness picks up whatever pieces of information it requires, and you serve them. <laughs> and you're in the middle, and you really, your, your only job is to be intentional and attentive and present, that's all. And all the rest happens. And I could see that in, with that kind of approach, you, you smell people's needs and questions. And you hear yourself saying something that, I mean, how many times did I hear myself saying, I, I didn't know before I said it. <laughs> and I knew it was the response to someone's question in the room. I knew because they raised it later. And, uh, and this kind of thing start to happen. And this is, this is the yoga, this is the religare, this is the religion. We know a lot of stuff, fine, it's there. Just be here, be attentive, be intentional from, you know, I want something beautiful to happen and engage. And then the down starts to happen. Like nature grows the flowers. Thank you for sharing this, Judy. Sahana, yes, I think that would be, no, we still have a little time. 
Yeah, hi. Um, Olga, see so you very I, soon. Thank you for being with us. Um, I, yes. Yeah, I wanted to talk about um, the whole brain versus heart right. uh, thing, right? Um, speaking for myself, um, I often think what I feel without feeling it. Um, so when someone asks me what you're feeling, I'm, I'm often thinking of what I'm feeling. And, and I feel the times where I truly feel something, yeah. I find it very difficult to verbalize what I'm feeling. Um, so when someone asks me what I'm feeling, I'm usually unable to share what I'm truly feeling. And I feel the need to maybe think then. And um, so, I mean, I figured out that eventually if I don't share what I'm feeling and I probably sit with the feeling or write about it, um, that is a better way for me to process the feeling than to put a name to it, verbalize it and share it out. Um, but it's always very interesting how the thought is always overtaking one's feeling and one's ability to experience yes, yes, uh, yes. something in in the present and i also noticed that the times where i have been truly present were the times where i felt a lot but wasn't able to express it but i had right. no thoughts during those times right. so the whole heart versus brain thing it's it's difficult to truly access what you really feel about a particular subject about anything mm -hmm. because the thought is always racing and taking over um, your heart <laughs> welcome to the 21st century <laughs> <laughs> that's how we, that's the, the whole social structure is about brain thought fast computer bzz, no running 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 that's why I was mentioning retraining ourselves to feel the heart, to look into the heart. And I, I just want to pick up on something, if you, if you allow me, about what you're sharing. There's no such thing as head versus heart. Uh, that's a 21st century concept, that thing. And it's a dangerous one. <laughs> I mean, it's a reality that uh, most people today think they're feeling. And I have that in my coaching. What do you feel? Well, I think I'm happy. Oh, really? You think you're happy? That's interesting. <laughs> do you feel happy? Oh, yes, 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 of course I do. <laughs> well, I think I'm sad. Are you crying? No, no, I'm drinking my chai. So what? <laughs> so we, we mentalize everything. We mentalize everything. But there's something that's extremely interesting to understand is that, and I discovered that in my own exploration before I saw there was some uh, research on that aspect also. The brain is informed by the heart. There is an ongoing uh, nervous communication system between heart and, and there's a little brain in the heart that we know now, there's a, a pack of neurons sitting somewhere in the heart. And there is much more data moving from there to here than from here to there, which means the way your brain operates, the way the mind operates, is actually informed not only by the heart and the feeling, but also by what you want. That's why we, we say an intention, you know, in, set an intention, because when you set an intention, you set the mode of your brain. And it's, in, it's very interesting to understand this because, so the problem of the heart-brain re relationship is that we've been taught to suppress the heart. And that's the biggest obstacle in feeling our feelings. You look in your heart, you feel something, and then your brain says, no, no, can't be that. I mean, your brain, sorry, your mind. Say, no, no, can't be that. You know, that's not the adequate answer. That's not what it should be. So you, you block it. And that's the biggest problem why we don't feel our feelings. Because the mind interferes and say, can't be that. It's allowed. Mama will not like it. Teacher will not like it. Forbidden. Taboo. God, God knows what, you know? And that's the, that's the obstacle. If I can bypass that and tell my mind, okay, fine, I really understand your story, but please be quiet for a moment. <laughs> I want to see what's there. And then I'll come to you. No problem, because it's not disconnected. 
And then what you are sharing is extremely interesting because a good heart-head connection, and this is personal power, and this is intelligence. First, you feel, and this is your primary perception. This is your primary intelligence. And with your mind, with your intellect, with that thing that is structured and intelligent and knows many things, as many names, then with that thing, you look at your feeling and say, ah, this is this. It means that. It implies that. All right. Now we know. Now we know. But first and second, not the opposite. And we've been taught first this one and second this one. Which is also true. You can create a beautiful feeling with a thought. <laughs> but, <laughs> but in terms of perception and in terms of intelligence, first feeling, and then with your intelligence, your, your intellect, you look at that and say, oh, this is the name of that thing. That's what it is. It's coming from there, going there. And that's what we can do with it. And now you have a proper, uh, proper intelligence at work. <laughs> Because they need to talk together. They, they absolutely should not be separated. But socially, we've, we've separated them. And just to give you another thing, uh, this, the, the, the conflict between the, the mind and the heart is the same conflict between man and woman in the family. <laughs> it's, it's exactly the same stuff. If you solve it inside you, you handle your relationship, masculine, feminine, much better. Because you understand those two types of language and how they are actually complementing each other. If a man can look at a woman going through all our emotion and you know, and with interest and seek to see what's really going on, he's gonna learn something fantastic. And if a woman has access to that mental stability that even in the middle of a storm you remain like you know clear, <laughs> which is our power as men, then you develop a fantastic. Strength, strength. And this is the way of, of, of building that is that I'm putting those two feeling first and then the intellect, the observer is looking at that feeling. What is it? What does it mean? What do I do with it? What does it imply, etc. And the only obstacle is the mind saying, no, can't be that. Must be something else. I can't feel that. <laughs> yeah, I the think way in out this of that is Mm -hmm. yes. In this fast-paced world, it's um, you always want to move on to the next task before you process something yeah. within yeah. you. So there, yeah. there isn't enough space and time for you to be with something before you exactly. can move on. And this is a huge problem. I'm working. I've been working in the leadership coaching also. The biggest problem in terms of decision making and the biggest blunder come because we don't spend enough time observing. Which means you launch into a situation, you go for a solution, and you have not observed the terrain. You didn't have time to really look, and you make a mess. And you blame others for it. <laughs> and. Uh, a powerful individual and a powerful leader is someone who takes the time to observe. Whatever time it takes. And when they've observed, when they've sensed, now they know and now they act and now they punch. Now they make an impact. Now they solve problems. And again, the heart is involved in that. Because uh, when we talk about perception, uh, at least 50% of it is feeling. The eyes, the ears, it's secondary, but the big one is feeling, sensing. Thank you. That's the little thing we learn with practicing yoga to, to, to develop that way of knowing. <laughs> and it's a, it's a very powerful one, it's a very beautiful one. It opens to magnificence, it opens to, to reverence, it opens to beauty, it opens to gratitude. There are two hands raised. Do we have time or no? It's seven past five. I don't know. Yep, we uh we have yeah. uh, we have till uh, another, I think, eight minutes because the next session is gonna start in about 23 minutes. Oh. So we can go for, for another eight minutes before the uh, the oh. tech host and the speaker of the next session join in. 
Good. Four minutes per hand. Five fingers <laughs> for. <laughs> yes. Who came first, Arifa or May Mu? She, her, how all? Wow. That's a whole program. <laughs> Do you want to go first, Mel? I, I don't. I don't. I don't mind. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just sitting with... Mm. Um, uh, ah, what? Say, 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 go ahead. <laughs> just say bye-bye to the team that I'm listening to you. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I, I, I guess I'm sitting with uh, what, what, what was alive, what's been alive for me for some time. Mm. Um, and... Uh, uh, I've recently committed to a religion and I've become quite, um, I guess I'm quite, I would identify as deeply religious. <laughs> um, and, and I've, I've come out about it, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, and uh, I think what I've uh, um, really felt touched by and really um, appreciative of um, in this session and in in, in your work and, ha and ha what you've mm -hmm. you've been sharing with us um, mm -hmm. uh, it's been a real a really um, good lesson for me um, I've had a lot of um, concern mm -hmm. around um, uh, preaching um, so so I uh, uh, um, I have, I have a lot, I have a, I have a love for my practice and mm -hmm. I want to share that practice with everyone, you know, nice. um, and, uh, and nice. what was so, um, great, um, is the, the, that you're bringing it back to a fundamental, um, mm -hmm. human experience. Nice. Um, you, you know, you, you're talking about love. You're yes. talking about, um, um, I guess the yeah the nature in in, in which we um in which we um live, um, yeah. and uh, in doing so, um, none of that um, worry that I have um, mm -hmm. can really um, be. Uh, um, proven <laughs> you know like you know like uh, some some sort of um uh because there's no problem you know i can i can be a thai forest theravadan buddhist here and not feel like um uh alien uh to um someone else that that um yeah. has a completely different um mm -hmm. uh, concept belief system of yes. the you know in the world yeah yeah. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for saying yeah. that. <laughs> and you are you are raising that thing that there are always those two systems working. We have concept, we have belief, we work with them. But they are just one part of the equation. The other part of the equation is that human connection. And like for the mind heart, it's the same thing. Human connection, feeling, togetherness and mind concept because yes we need to we need to name things we need to we also need to have conversations with words and and conceptualize things because that's also a power of being human we know how to conceptualize and we can create a very consistent system that are very useful so again it's that uh, it's those two things operating together and and monitoring them in our relationships when am i going too much into the conceptualization and i need to reconnect when am I connecting with and losing the conceptualization and therefore not being able to, you know, to do something with that moment of connection? <laughs> so it's, it's that balance between the two, between uh, connecting existentiality and the mentalization of it, the, the awareness of it, the conceptualization of it. And both are useful, both are needed. But the balance, <clears throat> the balance is the thing. Mm. And not just for religion, but even with our children, even with the people we love. One of the big challenges in human relationship is that 
we see people and we, we assume that we know because we live with them since 65 years. So we are totally convinced that we know them. But no, we don't. They are still new. And that knowing is creating the problem because we're going to assumption, expectation, all that disastrous stuff. So here again, balance. Yes, I know. I know your habits. I know the way you put your, your shoes in the wrong place when you come back home and I don't like it. I know that. <laughs> but I'm also allowing you to be new today because I, I want to feel you, because I, I, I observe you, because I accept you, because that balancing of all. And it's a delicate balancing. But it's a very powerful one. Very, very amazing one. Thank you for sharing, Mel. Arifa? Arifa, 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 Arifa. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Hi. Hello, everyone. So when I was listening to all of you and uh, I've, like, the start of my life has been very, very religious. I was absolutely into... Uh, like reading five times namaz and i'm from india and the entire culture and then at one point of time when i started questioning uh, the idea that if uh, this is something that's going to connect me to my higher source then it's got to be loving got like, to i can't be fear it. i exactly. just can't fear the goodness of all that exists and why am i being asked to fear it when it's so cool like if it's something that's actually making me better and it's making me more uh, in sync with myself and it's helping me connect to people, then why, how, come, uh, how come I'm being asked to choose or to divide or to judge? And when we are talking about God, we're like, he's not judging you and he's forgiving and he's all that. And I'm like, who am I to be that then? And why am I being asked to be that then? like for specific yeah. reasons because uh and those were my questions to my grandparents or people who were teaching me about my faith and I was like okay if it's so cool and if it's so nice and if it's making me better then how come I'm not allowed to uh include everybody because exactly. it's got to be everybody and if there is a divide this there, then there's some screw up perhaps in the way we're viewing this like yeah. I don't buy it <laughs> like I cannot buy it and I won't buy it. And uh, it's nice. It's really helping me connect to myself. But just the idea of separation is very disheartening. Awesome. Uh, it's very, and when it's justified in the name of religion, it becomes even more uh, like, ah, oh, no, 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 no. There's got to be something that we're missing here. Uh, because something as beautiful as love and something as beautiful as faith cannot uh, be okay with discrimination, cannot be okay with division, no matter how justifiable it seems. Of, of course. So uh, I think when I uh, kind of like looked at religion from a perspective of, okay, what are the practices that are helping me deepen my connection to myself and taking that and then leaving the rest behind saying, okay, I may be from the faith, but at the same time, I'm not going to follow everything in the book. I'm really mm -hmm. going to look at what feels right to okay. me. And I'm okay. going to move on from there. And I think that's the only thing that matters ultimately. And if God is so cool and so loving and so forgiving, then I don't think he has any reason to... Uh, want us to be in that space of you're right i'm right and you have to follow me and this is the only way and because there's so many ways there's so many pathways and there's so many things that work out for different people okay. so i think uh i've been blessed to have been encountered with so many people who kind of like uh helped me question in the way that made sense to me and kept that space open saying okay explore you don't mm -hmm. This doesn't seem right, stay in that space and explore. And this doesn't seem right, okay, stay in that space and explore. So I've, I feel very blessed that I'm in that space, like even with my family or with my uh, loved ones, wherein I am open to uh, my ideas and the ideas of inclusivity and the ideas of spirituality and the ideas of really questioning, ah, oh, 
this this is really cool but you know this part why don't we tweak it a little to fit our own consciousness yeah it's interesting yeah. we are talking about education and so far education has used fear guilt shame punishment as educational strategies which backfire big way they just don't work and now science knows that they know that if you use those things if you use fear you block the brain you make an individual stupid <laughs> which means they want to change but they can't because their brain is dysfunctional at that moment when it's under the influence of fear and guilt produces fear, separation produces fear, shame produces fear, punishment produces fear. And so here again, fundamental question, fear or love? Because it's one or the other, can't be both. Can't be both, no way. And love means connection. Uh, what I've discovered for myself also, you read, you have all those books that say, you know, love others. Yeah, sure, great idea, but how do I do that? They really get on my nerves, you know? <laughs> And, and but the moment I connect with someone, I can't do anything else than, than loving them because it's a beautiful thing, a human being. And I don't need to force myself to love them. Because just by connecting, suddenly I saw that thing and I said, wow. And maybe to close that, uh, that, that conversation, because I think the time is running out, I want to leave you with, a, I didn't plan that, but it's, that's the kind of uh, ideal conclusion to our <laughs> sharing. I, I was attending a talk one day with an old Christian monk, and he said something that really stayed in my mind forever. And that's at the very principle. You know, he was saying, the more you see beauty, and you see beauty when you, when you open, you can't see beauty if the door is locked. So the more you see beauty, the more you love. And it is natural. You don't need to force. And the more you love, the more you see beauty. <laughs> and the more you see beauty, the more you love. And the more you love, the more you see beauty. And it's a, it's, a, it's a tremendous circle that starts with attention, curiosity. What's, what's here? Oh, this is so interesting. This is so interesting. This is so beautiful. <laughs> but as you say, Aripa, the whole thing is pretty cool. The more I observe the nature, the more I observe the body, the more I observe the way we are built. We are built for joy. The whole world is built for joy. <laughs>